Have you guys gotten the recording thing done yet? It's still spinning. Yeah, I, I got the sound. Oh, yeah, I got it. It's on. I think it's on, yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll edit that. Um, yeah, so welcome to another uh, Research Hub community call, where today uh, we'll start by discussing um, potentially positioning Research Hub as a tool for uh, patient communication with scientists who are conducting clinical trials. Um, a little bit of context here. Well, I think two pieces of context. Um, one of the initial motivations for Research Hub was to um, lower the barrier for uh, non-formally trained uh, like citizen scientists, for lack of a better term, to become involved in academic research. Some of our early features like the editorialized title and earning tokens for like uh, layman summaries of papers are kind of geared towards uh, that kind of like scientific communication aspect. And so um, just recently, someone messaged me on LinkedIn who uh, was a graduate student at the California Institute of Technology who founded a like biotech startup um, in immunology where like, I'm gonna get this wrong, but um, it's like some engineered antibody to treat like immune related diseases. And so they shot me a message and they have like a, a patient like population that they essentially almost kind of like our community calls where they have like interested customers who are like participating in the development of their product. And so um, what they wanna do is essentially have like a specific hub within Research Hub for uh, specific diseases and then push their community towards these hubs in order to like take like a active role in engaging with like how the research is structured from like the teams uh, and like the actual methodology and then like reading like different papers and like sharing criticisms and basically um, trying to get like the patient population that will eventually receive the drug like into the whole R&D process kind of at the front end. So um, like one- I think that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. would love to hear kind of uh, what everybody thinks like top level. I think it's awesome. I think disease specific hubs would be really interesting. I would be interested in being able to like go into a hub where like experts on that disease are like sharing the up to date research, you know, maybe a family member has it, maybe you did a 23 and me and found out you're genetically prone to it, who knows, but I think there'd be like a huge market for that for both like academics and layman people. I think that I honestly think that sounds really cool. Yeah, thank you. Lynn. Yeah, I think from the from the academic side, it would be also pretty great um, because I, in my master's, I worked on like a, a rare disease as well, um, and it, it's just a good way to I think uh, something that you lose um, with being a researcher is you don't really you, you do research on diseases, but you don't really get too much exposure to patients with the disease, so you don't really know anything about their kind of like lifestyle, how their different like day to day life is impacted having the disease as well and i think it'll be a nice like gateway to communicate um and connect yourself with kind of the pragmaticness of your research and that there is a you know patient on the other side and you know they can give you feedback on their personal life and then maybe that can spur some kind of creative ideas for you to try to help solve certain things yeah nathan Hi, Patrick. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, so it sounds to me a bit like patient and public involvement in a study, right? And so I, I guess, so my first questions with relation to this are, is this going to be a different um, hub to the research discussion hub? Or are we inviting them to the same place? So for example, you have a cardiology hub and you have patients with cardiovascular diseases are you going to create a separate hub for the PPI or are they going to be in the same place? Um, if they're in the same place, then this is where the issues come about, I think, we, because this is like something that's discussed quite a lot. You know, how do you tailor PPI? I know a lot of the funders are ma now mandating PPI to get grant funding from the traditional charities, but a lot of the time they get dumped into like the main paper or the main protocol that was designed for other scientists and they're completely lost and they don't really know what to ask or, or whatever. I, I, I feel like they, they would do better in their own area where people are creating content for them or they can ask questions and then we can pitch ideas to them specifically, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, totally. So just to repeat back, you think it makes sense to have like dedicated hubs to these patient populations. Um, so that way, like their, you know, topics of conversation could be like kind of kept within one area. Yeah, exactly. Or or it could be the same hub. I just think we got to think about this uh, issue, I think, with other at attempts to incorporate PPI into traditional scientific discussion spaces, which is that it can be a bit overwhelming for patients. And a lot of the time their um, their questions and their their priorities can be quite different and they don't quite understand uh, as in it, uh, what's of interest to them is a bit different, maybe is, is the way I put it. Yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense. Ricardo? Could there be some space for hashtags here instead of uh, specific hubs? Like using an hashtag that could, you know, signal to people, you know, this is relatively to this. So if you don't like this, we can just like filter the content based on a specific hashtag. I remember someone was working on this a couple of months back. So if this, if that is still in the works, I think it might be a good use case for hashtags if we plan to use that in the future. I know that when we did our hub restructure for the social sciences, we were, uh, we planned for those hashtags, at least in the future. I think they're a great idea for like, filtering things that aren't like their own hub so like yeah like i even have a plan for that for the social social science hub so i would like to see that the tags as well yeah i think i think we'll definitely get there eventually kind of um kobe has been thinking a lot about sort of how like the main ux of research hub works um currently there's sort of like a paper-based discussion and like one issue here um is that like discussions are sort of hidden you have to click into a paper in order to see like high quality like peer review or like um you know comments about the paper and so kobe's at least in the very like initial stages of thinking of uh changing like the main ux to more of like a feed experience where um like any piece of content can show up into this feed so if ricardo posted a paper it would show up if i commented on that paper the comment would show up within the feed and we could have a bunch of different kinds of content uh, that could be hashtag for sure. So I think we're going to go in this direction kind of eventually is what it's looking like. Um, and yeah, the hashtags would make a ton of sense once it's like not, you know, more than just the paper as the unit of discussion. From a UI, from a UI perspective, would it um, kind of what Nathan was saying, like, would it make sense to have a completely separate like area it's like a separate even like kind of uh like headline uh so you'll have like maybe academic like hubs and then maybe like i don't know clinical or like layman's hubs or something like that or rare disease hubs as a completely separate like section so you or you have like the published on top and then so on and so forth um yeah because i think having it as its own separate entity might help people yeah who are laymen more like direct themselves into that area yeah so i think this is actually like a, a pretty important topic because like uh quality of content's a big deal right and so if we start to you know do outreach towards like like right now most of our users are grad students or early career researchers if we start to like specifically involve like uh you know user populations that like you know maybe more like coming from a non-academic background, um, do you guys think there's any risk to, to pursuing that type of user kind of at our early stage? Or like, like I guess one thing that I find compelling, and this might not be true, but um, one issue with crypto is how do you get the Harvard, MIT, Stanford professor who's like already at the top of their field to, to care about like earning crypto in sort of a, like a new incentive structure? And like, I might be wrong here. This might be like uh, too idealistic, but I think interacting with patients is a lot more compelling than um, earning crypto for people who are already at the top of their field and kind of like dedicated towards a cause. Um, so, so I guess like what I'm trying to say is like including patient populations could result in a reduced quality of content compared to like our average user today. But I think it would end up recruiting even higher quality users long term because they're able to interact with like the people who are like affected you know in the day-to-day -day from you know the disease that the researcher studies um is that like a reasonable assumption do you all think 
I think so, especially because a lot of universities don't necessarily have direct access to a clinical population, like if you're not partnered with a hospital, for example. So like a lot of people like who might be interested in studying a disease might not even have like these people who to, to talk to or you might be able to like get in touch with people who could do like online studies, which have become a big thing. Like maybe if you can't get these people to come to your city, you could at least um, do some sort of virtual work with them. I think um, it could be great, you know, for researchers finding patient populations that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. I think that's part of their motivation too, is to create like evergreen, like SEO content within this hub to then like bring in people who have the disease that they're trying to treat in order to recruit, you know, more patients for their clinical trials. So yeah, I think there's a lot of ways it could make sense both ways. Uh, Sadiq? So, yeah, I was also uh, going to say uh, in agreement with Jeffrey and Nathan that a separate space for this would make more sense. And specifically, I think a separate hub would make the most sense because uh, if I'm interested, like if I'm not academically inclined at all, and if I'm just uh, interested in two separate diseases that uh, I might have a lot of chances of sort of developing, it would be uh, it would be better if I could just log into research hub and go to my hubs and get all of the content about those two diseases specifically. And also uh, on on those disease specific hubs, it would uh, it would make a lot more sense for us to increase our sort of editorial standards so that uh, specifically uh, all sort of jargon is removed and uh, we can even create uh, sort of templates. Uh, that can uh, uh, that can split up what the editor has to write, which could be what exactly was the study testing, what exactly are the results, what are some of the common misinterpretations that you could reach out. That would sort of help non-academics to make more sense out of the papers. I think uh, that would be really cool if you could do that. Yeah, totally. I, I even think this is going to work nicely with our bounties feature where like someone may, you know, request a layman summary of a comment, um, you know, could fit nicely. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, I, I completely agree with what Satvik said. And also I'm just re responding to your point about whether it would help bring in the, you know, big name professors. And I, I would absolutely agree that it would because it doesn't matter what level of um, researcher you are, you have to include PPI and how you've actively engaged in PPI to your grant applications. And if you can show more comprehensive patient and public involvement in your grant application, you're going to get more funds. So it's in everyone's interest. So I, I think, you know, if Research Hub can say we have this active community here of this disease patient population here, look at this discussion, that's going to bring people in for sure, in my opinion. Um, and in terms of the risk, I think, yeah, Satvik's like touched on it. I, I think the risk is is misinformation. If if the reputation of these hubs or, you know, area spaces, whatever, of these patients becomes a place of misinformation, then it will get discredited by the researchers and the clinicians. And, and, and that's where it goes. That's the risk, essentially. So I, I completely agree the, the way to combat that would be just more editorial oversight. Um, yeah, I, I, but, but but by by all means it can be done because because that's sort of what we're doing now. It's just going to be that, but a little bit more more intensive, I suppose. Yeah, it's a great point. Even like the editorial oversight, like this is in theory like a startup, you know, which I'm sure want their product to work. So we probably need to have like one of our own immunology editors, kind of like uh, co uh, moderating the discussion, just to make sure to keep everybody honest. Um, uh, Joanna. I think we can promote on the fact that many universities and PhDs were affected by the remoteness of uh, the pandemic, for example. And maybe we can advertise to promote on that. And um, I think we can also add that Research Hub is open source and uh, um, the researchers can interact with other 
professionals in a more simple way and have access to more papers. Because I think there, there's a lot of restriction, especially when you, when you are doing your PhD in a certain area and you need something from a different area. So maybe we can gather something to, yeah, to formulate something on that. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I agree in that it's, it's like compelling, I think, it, even just from like an outsider perspective, like, hey, what does Research Hub do and helps bring together researchers to like patients, I think is, it, it just makes sense um, from an outsider perspective, pretty easy. Um, yeah, for example, for, example uh, for health, I mean, the researchers can even gain patients with uh, being more tech savvy and uh, connecting with. Yeah, totally. There's even examples like um, one of the founders of Clubhouse, uh, mm -hmm. his, his child has like a rare genetic disease and like him and his wife have like, like on, kind of like in their own free time, like pushed forward the study of this rare genetic disease. Um, so yeah, I think there's lots of examples of people who just really care, who put in a lot of effort and like can actually contribute to the research conversation um, around a condition. So yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I guess uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, Sapik, last thought. Yeah, uh, so it's I might be getting too ahead of everything here, but uh, if we go ahead to sort of create this community of uh, patient participants, uh, is there any sort of... Uh, uh, is there any sort of vetting process that we will have to incorporate so that we make sure that we are providing a quality pool of participants to the researchers that we reach out to? Uh, and is there any way of doing this that isn't exactly invasive? Uh, so, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Like, verified authors are a lot easier than verified patients. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that's really something we want to get into. Like, um, we'd have to figure that out. That seems like, you know, like a cross that bridge when we come to it type of problem. So you said something very interesting about Clubhouse. So maybe we can incorporate some, some audio discussions. Like it, it doesn't have to be very scientific. In this way, even the non-scientific are attractive research yeah totally tiktok reviews of papers <laughs> I, th I think that would actually be pretty good um mm. yeah i mean in the sense of engaging so maybe we can do like on discord or somewhere else talks like informal talks yeah definitely um we could totally do like TED Talks on specific diseases or something from like patient advocates, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so just to uh, keep the schedule moving, um, unless anyone has any last thoughts on that topic, I'll report back kind of on how this conversation goes and maybe reach out to a couple of other uh, patient advocacy groups to see if there is something here. Um, so SciCon is right around the corner. Um, 10 days from now is when people can start uh, submitting like actual content for the competition. So we want to start to really rev up some of the marketing efforts. Um, and what I want to do for the next 10 minutes is um, one, talk about like uh, office hours that I want to put together. Um, I'll, I'll post this in the Discord and uh, Slack channels, but I'll um, do like three separate two hour sessions uh, this upcoming week um, for marketing. SciCon, essentially like like a, a cold email group study, you know, for lack of a better term. So I'll, I'll jump on like a Google Meets and um, like send cold emails to like people who I think would be interested and in like meta science departments at different universities. And so if anybody is interested, um, feel free to hop on with me and we'll just kind of do it like a kind of like a study hall where if anybody wants to help send emails, like I'll just be there for like two or three 
two hour sessions this week and just hop on and I'll kind of like show you how I've sent cold emails in the past and we'll try and blast out like a couple thousand emails if we can get some people signed up. Um, yeah, and so that I, I always think like a personal touch is really effective, especially in academia. So I think cold emails are pretty good um, compared to like ads or like social media stuff. But I guess like um, thinking that uh, submissions are about 10 days away. Does anyone here have any uh, other ideas marketing wise um, that we can try and get SciCon in front of like meta science, uh, you know, inclined grad students who might want to participate? Uh, just to clarify, is it just cold emails right now or is it anything else? Is, sorry, Sapik, what did you say? Uh, I was asking just so that uh, it's clear. Are we just sending cold emails right now or are we doing anything else in addition to that? Yeah, I think any any other ideas. I know cold emails have worked well for me in the past. Um, another thing that's also worked well is just like DMing uh, like people who I would want to retweet like something about an event. So there are like some prominent like science influencers, for lack of a better term, uh, who just like like to support this type of thing. So like it's easy to shoot like influencers message or messages and ask for a retweet just like out of the kindness of their hearts. So that's that's another decent strategy. Um, but yeah, does anybody else here have like ideas of stuff that we could do kind of manual labor wise when it comes to trying to uh, spread the word about SciCon? I think independently, everyone should leverage the channel that they have. They feel that they're more they have the most power. Like for example, I my my Twitter is ridiculous, but like my 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 LinkedIn is actually a bit better. Have a little bit more following, so I could leverage that a bit more. And uh, even on Instagram, I have a lot a lot a lot of like people that I know that study and do like PhD and so on. So independently, everyone should use their own channels. Of the you know as they as they feel it's 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 more uh, it would get the best results. As of research shop, I think you know cold emails. I would. I uh, love to do that office hours with you and anyone else that want to join because I really feel emails are the way to go for academics. Well, maybe reaching out to some meta science associations, but it, it may be too late for that because, you know, it could be slow the process on, you know, getting to that association and then getting the message to the members. So, yeah, probably called emails is the best one here. You want? Uh, I think the term meta science, it's kind of wide, so we should focus like on some specific groups, categories, because it's very abstract and people are, are running away from abstract things. So we, we plan to uh, send out a couple tweets, uh, uh, actually a couple threads uh, explaining better what what is you know the the topic of the of the of the conference? So hopefully we get that cleared out a bit better. And on the website we actually have a short explanation for what is meta science. That is basically this the science of doing science. Uh, so an idea here could be sending out a couple of tweets and maybe using you know also the other channels that Research Hub has to you know explain the better in better terms meta science and maybe redirecting people to the homepage. Where we get an explanation of you know what it is yeah great idea but like to be more specific as patrick said to whom are we explaining so like to be towards a certain category are we explaining to springer to DAOs, to recent graduates well, I, yeah, so I think the audience will most probably be graduate students. This is what I feel it would be. So, um, you know, I was I, I did not know what meta science was before we, we, we started this event. But, uh, you know, if you if you see a couple of definitions, then you probably probably, you know, get into it without even, you know, reading a paper. Uh, we should probably do a better job here in explaining what is what is me what meta science wants to do and why we think that is important so again i think uh probably a couple of explanatory tweets would would make it here 
uh, would probably you know help our our audience. Uh, if you think there's any other medium that we could use to explain that better, um, something that I was you know doing today, and I think it's useful. Uh, could I was thinking about doing that in the future is uh, actually running a couple uh, Loom videos explaining some like Research Hub 101, like intro to Research Hub, where I basically explain how to set up your profile, how to use the ELN and so on. I could do something similar where, I mean, I'm not an expert in meta science, so it feels weird to me, but I could do something where I make like a 30 seconds video where I explain what a meta science is. Again, I'm not really entitled to explain that because it's not my field, but I could do that if that helps. Mm -hmm. But like we should have a target audience, so we should be more specific about whom are we explaining to, because it's it's summer and like I don't know, people don't know. For example, if they should upload uh, their previous research, if they should come up with something new, if are we looking for like more DAOs specific research stuff like that. And personally, like in the latest, latest phase, I will do an ad. I know it sounds, it sounds like um, anti dows but that's what I will do now. Yeah, it's a great point. I, I think probably our target user is kind of like the people on this call, you know, sort of like early career academics or like scientific you know, minded individuals. Um, so yeah, I think that there are like a lot of like uh, grad student departments, uh, like meta science departments. So I think we can, you know, have some success blasting out to these departments and asking to get on like listservs for the meta science students. And uh, yeah, kind of saying, hey, you can win some money if you like write a good blog. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so we may, yeah, I, I see frequently this type of, of of, of promotion in emails, yeah. So if you know the grad students that are into meta science, that's awesome. Ricardo, one thing that you mentioned earlier was like um, sh shooting out like uh, a social post from like whatever social media y you think like you have, you know, is most advantageous to you. Um, maybe we should set up a bounty for this, uh, just like if you, you know, like tweet about it on LinkedIn or post on Instagram or something like that, they're earning like a little bit of RSC to say thanks. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. We could do that also pretty easily. Um, we can we can set up a bounty for, and I will leave it pretty free. Like we use whatever platform you, you feel is more uh, is best for you. But maybe you know, in the summary, once you complete a task, put in you know the kind of like a link to it, and that's that's pretty much it. Because again, I feel here someone should do, anyone should do what what I think is best. Cool. Yeah, I think like a couple LinkedIn posts would actually do pretty well here too. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, I think some low hanging fruit that we haven't done yet is just harnessing the people from other uh, DSI communities that say Vita DAO, Molecule, etc. Just going into their discords and just putting out a post sharing the message. Um, especially if we have people who are within those communities who are research hub members, if we have a, a bounty or, I mean, I think it would be strongest coming from you, to be honest, Patrick, if you were in like the Vita Dao, um, discord and you as, you know, obviously the vote front front of, uh, research hub, just posting, just saying, you know, we're running an event. I'm sure that they'll be the easiest guys to get to sign up just cause they're, everyone's just helping each other out in terms of their events, et cetera. Totally. Yeah. So I can do that tonight. Um, so Peter Dow, um, any others specifically that you think I should stop by? Yeah, there's like Lab Dow, Cure Dow. Um, you know, there's a bunch of them from Molecule. They're the ones who ran D-Side Berlin. So there's a few offshoots of that. Fleming Protocol is another one that comes to the top. So you think just do all the D-Side companies? Yeah, absolutely. I think they're the ones where they're probably going to come anyway once they find out about it. But it's just nice to get them on board to start just so that we've got that base of people who, you know, are the core attendees. 
totally. That's a great call. And Nathan, thanks for telling me I should do that because uh, yeah, it wasn't on my radar. So I appreciate the the um, nudge there. Topic. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this depends on our budgets that we currently have. But uh, can we afford to get some freelancer to make like a minute or a minute and a half explainer on what meta science is and why this matters, like why the conference matters? Uh, I think we can draft up a, a pretty neat script and keep it extremely tight so that it doesn't get boring at all. Uh, and if we can get it done within, I think, three days, then uh, we can have we can have like at least four to five days minimum to uh, to run a video, and we can keep the registrations open uh, even after our sort of plenary talks, so that that way we get like ten days to uh, to let the video circulate and uh, let it bring in people. Uh, in addition to that, I sent this uh, link uh, in the chat, uh, and we can create slider posts like this they do pretty well on linkedin or if somebody has a nice instagram following uh, we can create uh, it for those i can uh, i can work with anyone uh, who knows uh, who knows what they are talking about and i can sort of design these posts uh, and then we can uh, provide them to our editors for independent circulation on their own linkedin uh, so that could be one uh, another way that we go about it so like three to four posts like this would help us a lot. So those are the two ideas that I had. Been. Okay, cool. Uh, Safik, can I, I'll message you afterwards to follow up and uh, try and try and get these wheels put in motion here. Write that down. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. And so I guess like any other last thoughts on uh, potential ways to market Psycon? Um, if not right now, uh, during the office hours this week, we can kind of talk about it and try a whole bunch of different things. And also, feel free to send a message uh, whenever you want. We have all the channels related to the, to Psycon, or you can just use a general channel. Whatever, anything that comes to your mind, just put it in the Discord. We'll always take a look. OK, cool. Awesome. Yeah, so um, for the next like 10 minutes or so, uh, I kind of wanted to grab like top level feedback on an idea um, that I came across when actually doing outreach for uh, SciCon last week. Um, so we've talked a little bit about like tokenomics and how to uh, give research coin more utility in a way that will actually um, like help to increase like buy side pressure and then have like a token velocity sync too. So that way people don't immediately sell the coins that they earn on the platform. Um, I think like we're, we're headed in the right direction here with bounties, but I don't know if bounties are like the end state for utility of research coin. Um, I, think, I think getting into funding somehow is like the real big fish that we could try and capture with like research coin and actually like help to um, accelerate science by making the allocation of funding much better than it is now. Um, and so one idea that kind of like came across my mind and just want to like throw it out there and hear what everybody thinks is uh, doing a tokenized um, registered report. Um, do, I just out of curiosity, have people here heard of registered reports before? Nope. You mean like a pre-registered study on like OSF? Yep. So, yeah, so absolutely. I do it with all my studies and I think it should become common practice. Yeah, so registered reports are really interesting. They're like, um, basically you can get an article accepted into a journal before you even conduct the research based on the pre-registration. So you can go to a journal, uh, if it's a registered report journal and they say, hey, like we make, like acceptance decisions based on the methodology. And so if you like run experiments as you described, regardless of the results, we're going to publish it. So even if you get negative results, we're going to publish it. And it makes research better because uh, you can't hypothesize after the results are known. And like a bunch of other things that kind of introduce like small biases into research. And so um, here's like just to help conceptualize this a little bit better. Here's kind of like the flow 
of a registered report. Essentially, like you share a pre-registration here, and there's a peer review where um, people will give you feedback on your study design. And eventually, like if it's deemed worthy for publication, it's accepted. Then you collect the data, you write the manuscript, it goes through peer review a second time, where you then have like version control and kind of like the more traditional like peer review process, but with like a guaranteed acceptance. So this is just to improve the manuscript itself. And then finally you publish like a peer reviewed paper at the end of the process. What I'm thinking here could be kind of cool is if we tokenized this acceptance decision, like uh, in theory, we could have every hub with like hub specific reputation vote on like five studies a quarter or something like that, where um, like people share pre-registrations and the top five kind of as determined by a community token vote would end up um, being eligible to receive funding on Research Hub and have like guaranteed peer review and a like peer reviewed publication kind of at the end of the process. Um, the reason why I like this is we can create demand where like if you're a you know, biochemist and you wanna have influence over what papers end up published in the biochemistry hub, you might wanna either earn tokens or buy them uh, in order to help to influence what kind of content is being shared and getting peer review in a specific hub. Um, and then it also encourages people to keep tokens. So like if you're a big part of the biochemistry hub, you might not necessarily sell all of your tokens immediately if you want to have influence in this like uh, kind of curation process for what studies are going to be published through the hub. Um, so yeah, sorry if that's not like the most concise uh, explanation, but curious kind of what everybody thinks, if there's uh, anything to this like tokenized registered report thing. And I guess like, sorry, one piece of context. Um, earlier today, I got an email from OSF that uh, Calabra, this is a psychology journal, like an open access psychology journal. They're actually funding studies based on pre-registrations. So they have like $5,000 and they plan to assign it to 10 different psychology studies based on the pre-registrations. So not tokenized whatsoever, but like playing with the idea of like funding research, not based on a grant application, but based on a pre-registration. So yeah, cu curious what everybody thinks. I think that's great, especially for attracting like scientific researchers. Yeah, and we can also like partner with universities stuff like that in the sense of promoting scientific accredited research. Yeah, so I, I like this idea. Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a much more compelling reason to people like why they need to have tokens, like why you need to claim your paper. So that way you get these tokens and you can <coughs> influence, like publishing decisions. Like, I think that makes a lot more sense than just, hey, here are these tokens and you can have governance rights, you know, or, or like be able to do bounties um, with them. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, as a researcher myself, I would have loved if something like this was an option. Like, I hate grant writing, but like I am big on pre-registration. So I think that's a really cool concept of being able to just like get your study funded through a pre-registration. Um, yeah, and like if anybody wants to see examples, like I have open pre-registrations on OSF, you literally just search my name and my projects come up so you can see ones I have written before, um, for examples of like how they're written and whatnot. Yeah, I like pre-registrations a lot because they're like uh, way easier. Like it's like um, kind of like six paragraphs, maybe like a page and a half, two pages of like you have to know what you want to do, but it's just yeah, a lot easier to actually write that document than it's a grant application. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, and my favorite is that it stops like the change, you know, the post hoc hypotheses that, you know, a lot of people just like change their quote unquote hypothesis to fit their results and pre-registration to stop that from happening. Yeah, totally. So, sorry, this is a little bit of an aside, but I always think about like that where like you can't even really blame those people just because like all they want to do is be able to do research. And that's just like they're just trying to get funding. You know, right. No, it's 
you got to be able to publish null results. It, it, you're right. It's not their fault. Journals won't publish if they don't have, quote unquote, significant results. Yeah, totally. And, and so I, I could see like a kind of forward thinking funders being about this and wanting to like buy tokens in order to like help to fund this type of like, you know, capital allocation mechanism. Because I, I bet the research that would come out of it would be better if everything Agreed. is registered. Yeah. Uh, Ricardo? Yeah, I like this idea too. And I think also something interesting to think about here is that we're uh, probably targeting a different audience. We're not looking at grad students anymore. We'll be looking at people that want to direct their research in specific directions. So that might actually be an additional uh, reason to, to go down this road. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Nathan? Uh, yeah, no, I, I like the idea. I'm just wondering. So, where's the uh, where's the funding coming from in this um, in this model? So, the research coin is being used as a uh, voting system and a governance of the funding. But I'm wondering what's backing it. Yeah. So this is this is like um, you know hand wavy, right? Like I don't think we've thought this all the way through yet. But one idea that I had is um, like we, we want to eventually have some kind of like creator coin for projects right or like a nft like if you want to like you know raise money for a study like maybe you mint 100 nfts that go along with it like 30 percent you know get retained by the authorship team and then 70 percent are sold you know for resources to like fund your study um so what we could do here is like we want to you know eventually we haven't figured out how to fit it in right yet but have like a nft marketplace within Research Hub. So maybe um, not everyone can be listed in the NFT marketplace. Maybe you have to be approved by the community to be listed. And so if your pre-registration is deemed worthy of funding and you've been voted you know, to be accepted into the journal, if you're able to accomplish the methods that you described, then also you are now eligible to mint NFTs for your project and be listed within the Research Hub NFT marketplace. Like basically have like a a gatekeeping around who can mint NFTs to the community had to have voted that we want this project to be published on Research Hub via registered report. So so yeah, in theory it would be like you share a registered report because you're gonna gain access to like this funding marketplace where like you might be able to like raise money for your project in order to actually make it happen. So essentially, the funding comes from a community. So the funding comes from the community. But so, so my under, my question is, why are we going for the governance of that funding before we've got the funding? It seems a bit the other way around. I'm not sure. I, I think we could get funding. I, I think like like even this Collabra thing, it's like 5K over 10 projects. And so, yeah, it might start off small. But I think there's an appetite for creative ways to fund science that makes science better. And I think like, I feel really confident we'd be able to get like a forward thinking funder to be like, hey, we commit X dollars over the next five years to this thing to try and make it happen. So my question is, so it would be external funders that are using our service rather than internal funding pool being allocated through research projects. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and we're kind of like the uh, like listing curation, right? So there's no like, you know, equivalent of shit coins getting put up on the Research Hub Marketplace, right? Sure. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I like it. I like it a lot. Cool. Um, yeah, so if anybody else has any ideas here, um, this is like a, a plug for our tokenomics discussion. So uh, we chatted about a bunch of different like potential features we could build in tokenomics wise. Um, I guess it was last week, a little bit before that. And so we're gonna have another call um, this Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so like noon Eastern, uh, if anybody wants to join, we'll be kind of like discussing a bunch of different tokenomic features that we might be able to build into Research Hub to try and like kind of sure up like the buy side pressure and try and create a velocity sync for Research Coin. So yeah, Thursday at noon Eastern, if anybody wants to join. Um, 
yeah, and so for the last 10 minutes here, uh, unless anybody has anything else to say on like a potential tokenized registered report, um, I wanted to take a second and introduce Cole. Uh, Cole is a new uh, Research Hub community member and uh, editor of the Immunology Hub, who uh, has like a pretty awesome YouTube channel where he has been reviewing uh, like immunology papers for the past couple of years, has a nice little following going. Um, and yeah, Cole offered to potentially like help uh, anyone who's in the research hub community who wants to create video content like this around papers uh, to do it. So we're thinking about ho hosting like a couple of workshops um, for anybody who would want to actually make like video summaries of papers. So yeah, Cole, if you don't mind, you uh, want to hop in, introduce yourself really quick. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Pat. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Cole. Uh, I have been working on my YouTube channel called Investigate, Explore, Discover for the past uh, year and a half. And like Pat mentioned, it's just really uh, lay summaries in video format. So that way science, like primary science can be more accessible to more people. Cause I start, started this during COVID where I found that people like the general public, it seemed had a, there was a disconnect in the trust in science. So I figured one way to help bridge that and to use uh, some of the expertise that I have gathered through schooling is to make these lay summaries that are meant to be more easily digestible. So science doesn't seem as like foreboding basically. So it's not as intimidating for people if they wanna take a look at primary science, it's accessible for them. I've been doing immunology related papers because I am trained in immunology. I have my uh, master's in it. And that's kind of where I decided to stop. Uh, but basically, if yeah, I'm would love to put on seminars for people that also want to make video abstracts and summaries of the papers. Uh, yeah, if there's any questions, please shoot them. Uh, I just you, I, yeah, I I saw I saw one of your videos. I, I wasn't able to go through through all of that, but I'm I'm planning to do so. Uh, but that's a gut on a chip. You also do microfluidics and stuff. That, that's pretty cool. Like that's something that I I was actually pretty interested in. So I would love to. I'll go over the video and like shoot you a couple questions. Because that, that yeah, was sure. that kind of like uh, struck me because I, I saw it. I was like, what? Well, that's that's not really immunology. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Do immunology, immunology adjacent because immunology kind of bleeds into a lot of other subjects. Yeah. That's kind of at least for testing, I guess, you know, like all the, all those like lab on a ship kind of set systems. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Oh, yeah, really interested. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Um, I was wondering, so uh, I'm interested to hear that you're trying to tailor your content to lay people. So of the YouTube videos that you've uploaded so far, how many do you, th how, what proportion of your viewers do you think are other students who are benefiting from your explanations of the papers and what, what proportion are lay people and how have you managed to explain immunology to lay people? Because I feel like even as a even as someone with a basic understanding of immunology through my med, med schooling, um, I found it incredibly, incredibly complex. So, yeah, I'm interested to hear how you did that. Uh, I would love to be able to tell you the analytics, but unfortunately, YouTube just gives me uh, sex, age, and location. So they don't particularly tell me how many, if any of these people are students. Uh, how I go about explaining immunology is basically the topic of the paper and the results are what drives the basic uh, or description at the beginning because my videos have a generalized format where I spend at about a third, I try to get a third to half of the video of an introduction of all of the important concepts that will be related to the results from the paper because I don't need to go into every topic in detail. Like if uh, we're talking about HIV infections, you need to know what HIV is, 
a little bit about viral replication because that's usually what HIV treatments are focused on, uh, what CD4 T cells are, how they function, how they interact with some of the other cells, uh, and what, like how the disease, and I want to instill like why HIV is significant. So it's not kind of getting people to drink from the fire hose of immunology, it's just specific things that are related to the paper. Uh, yeah. It's funny, yeah. Cole, our, our discussion earlier about like, um, like uh, patient populations, you know, like trying to like basically participate in academic research about like the disease that impacts them. Like that is literally exactly what we were saying is like, we'll need people to like help make content to, to have it be digestible for the average patient. And that's like literally exactly what you're doing. <laughs> when somebody said that, I was like, it's pretty cool. Cause like, we've kind of got all the pieces here. Um, yeah. And so, so I guess Cole, like nobody here has made videos like you've done in the past. So it's kind of up to you, like how you would want to like um, go about like hosting a seminar. I think we could probably get like, like three to five people who would want to show up and actually like make videos with you. So yeah, I guess like in, in your mind, what's the best next step to get this thing kicked off? Uh, I guess getting people who are interested together in one place. Uh, I have general structures of how I make my presentations of what goes into them. Uh, making these are not difficult. It's very much like just giving a poster session for your research. Uh, except I do it with other people's research because if I was just doing my own, I'd run out very quickly. <laughs> uh, but basically the more people that want to talk about their science directly, the better it is. Because if somebody else has more insights into what went into the paper, they've got little tidbits that they want to share like that is more beneficial for reaching more people uh, but going forward yeah just getting people together where i can distribute the materials that i have in general uh, yeah and then with the videos as well sorry i know this is jumping all over the place but as well after making the videos i can go through how to record how to uh, make them because when i started out I just did it on my phone. Like it's very accessible to do these things. You don't need anything particularly fancy. And if you do more of them, you'll get better as you go. That's that's something I would not worry about. Like everybody has to start from somewhere. Uh, but I can help people go through the process, what is kind of entailed if you wanna uh, ask for feedback on the things you're doing be more than happy to help with that and helping with video editing. But yeah, the ultimate first step would be just getting together people that are interested. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll talk to Anton and get something like on the community schedule. Do you think like a, like an hour, half an hour? How, how long do you think would be good for a first session? Maybe an hour just to block it off. And if it ends early, then people have time back to do whichever, because I want to make sure that there's not uh, a rush if people have questions or want to know more. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll get that set up. And I'll, I'll message you afterwards to find a time that's convenient for you uh, in order to like offer some scheduling stuff. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Cole. Thanks for stopping by and explaining everything. I think that's like super exciting. So I'm so glad we'll be able to get something going here. Um, yeah, so we have one minute left. Any uh, last questions for Cole about making videos or uh, any thoughts in general, feedback on Research Hub? I mean, I, I, I could see this working really well if, if people were incentivized to make one of these videos and then upload it with the paper on Research Hub. And then we could also have like a bounty for making the video with it. So it's just a bit more engaging. And then we could make, you know, a video for the uh, patient population hub version for the patient so that they also understand what's going on. So I think it all works really well together. I really like it. Yeah, I agree. I think this is very cool. Um, Preprints.org is like a, a new company that popped up as kind of like a preprint server. Uh, their main business model is offering like graphical abstracts to authors. 
So I think authors pay something. I'm making this up, but it's like 350 bucks to have like a like graphic designer create a graphical abstract. And so, yeah, if an author will do that for like a static image, like I would think they would do the same um, as a bounty for a video uh, about their paper. I even bet that it would increase citations long term. But um, yeah, I, th I think a lot of authors would pay decent money to have like a quality video made about their papers. I think that could increase the, the citation score a lot, the number of citations a lot. Like I, I honestly like a lot when, when I find some, normally I think it's in nature, uh, but I find some, some videos, uh, even like some experiments carried out and filmed by the, by the research group that really helps explaining, you know, kind of like seeing what happens, you know, behind the, beyond the PDF, let's say. So yeah, I love that. And actually I saw your post on, a research job. So what you were saying, Nathan, it's basically already kind of happening because I saw Cole's post uh, with, you know, the video embedded. So, uh, yeah, I, I really think, you know, that could be a pretty cool opportunity too. So question for Cole, do you think that you or by you can engage with this about you know, you know, you know. Oh, Joanna, I, we can't, can you guys hear, uh, Joanna? No. It's it's kind of buzzing. You've got some feedback going. Cool. Um, oh, nice. Okay, no, you can hear. Okay. Better, yeah. So, yeah. So, question for Cole: Do you think that we can do weekly or biweekly um, a special? discussion with the research hub community about immunology and some topics you you think they are like good for that discussion or like in any format you think it's suitable because i think youtube it's kind of large so something more interactive so you're proposing to have weekly or bi-weekly sessions that interact about immunology topics? Mm -hmm. So one thing we've talked about is um, having journal clubs. So like uh, we have a bunch of authors in our community and haven't totally gotten the ball rolling here and it's my fault, but um, inviting authors to do journal clubs during these community calls, like kind of on every other week. So yeah, we could uh, like pick immunology papers that are relevant, you know, for the average person and do like an hour long um, journal club about it where like everybody can, you know, take 45 minutes, read it beforehand and talk about it in like a layman's, you know, kind of um, phrasing way. And then we can publish that video um, to the comment section on the paper on Research Hub too. Yeah, and maybe something with bounties and tokens, but like as a further discussion. Yeah, there's a lot of directions this could go in. Um, Safik, to close it out. Uh, yeah, uh, Cole, this might be a little personal, uh, so you can just reject to answer. But uh, do you have any data on the retention of the videos? Uh, so, how, like, when do you observe the audience dropping off? Uh, so, in case we decide to do video marketing for research, uh, what should we aim? Sure. Uh, so, on YouTube, my videos range from realistically about 12 to 15 minutes and my average retention is i think four and a half minutes uh but all of my videos as well are subdivided into chapters so typically in the first five minutes is just an introduction of like all of the relevant topics and then people go on to the actual results so that's what that looks like. I assume that some people that are just not interested kind of click off soon. And then the people that watch all the way through, I think it's on average about 30-ish 30, 30 percent that watch all the way through. So. That feels pretty high. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. Well. Thanks, everybody, for uh, attending. Um, until next week. See y'all. See y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.